Welcome to my talk, uh, Architecture for Up Bundles. Uh, let me tell you like, uh, what exactly we are going to, talk, to be talking about today. So actually, it's not about all Up Bundles. I would like to focus today about the architecture on the dynamic feature modules uh, specifically and uh, what feature dynamic feature modules that uh, Google announced at the I.O., what they basically mean for, uh, for your architecture or they, what they meant for my architecture. And uh, the question I basically asked myself after, um, after Google announced the app bundles for the first time was like, okay now, so will my team need to spend the next two many years uh, to rewrite the app to make it compatible with the dynamic features? All right? Um, um, but let's stick to that one. Much shorter, much, e much more easy to remember. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mateusz, I'm from Poland. I work as the Android tech lead at IG. I co-organize co the Google Developer Group meetups in Krakow. I also organize uh, DroidCon. Um, and I'm a member of the Google Developer Expert Program. For those that know me already, thanks very much for bearing with me for all those years. That's actually the fifth time uh, I'm at this conference and well at the beginning of the year I always plan all right so October is Lviv and now I can plan the rest of the stuff I will be doing through the year all right um, let me start with a little bit of a story before we before we jump actually to bu up bundles I have 40 slides to tell you about our developer experience before January 2018 and you will very soon get like a why January 2018 is actually pretty important for us so before that moment uh, our application was structured in three different modules. So we had the app module, which was basically the Android app module. So with all the Android stuff, all the Android SDK, like intents, bundles, blah, 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 context everywhere. This was, this was the place within the, its place was within the app module. Then we had the core module, which was purely uh, Java module uh, to keep the business logic. And we had the data module for Jackson, Pojos, retrofit gateways, etc. And the structure of the dependencies looked in a way that app depended on core and data and data depended on core. Okay, um, rings a bell. Somebody on, the, somebody on the audience has some kind of a similar structure? All right, plenty of people. So uh, there are, we realized that there were some problems with it. Um, so we had lots of useless interfaces just to map stuff from one module to another. So well abstract clean code um, uh, well maybe when we are reading the materials about the Android clean architecture we misinterpreted it and we realized only after three years uh, so maybe that was entirely our fault mappers were everywhere uh, because you were downloading something the code for downloading like a JSON file and parsing it to some pojo was within the data module we then had to convert it into the core module and then somehow when you had to use like a resources from Android, you would need to add another abstraction layer because you couldn't reference this Android stuff from the core module and so on and so on. So we basically had lots of code which wouldn't be needed otherwise. And even the simplest changes require recompiling of all those modules. So our incremental builds took like a minute and a half, yeah? You were changing one stuff and then it's bound through all the code base, everything had to be recompiled. And um, when somebody was like a reopening a pull request to add a new field to the endpoint we were already supporting, and effectively that new field had to be dumped on some recycler view, lots of classes were changed. Yeah? And um, stuff became unbearable. Development time was really slow. Uh, the build times were extremely slow. We had problems with build machines also because of that, because of the huge queues. Um, so we decided to do something with that. And we came up with the new structure in January 2018. Actually, uh, my manager said, all right, go for it. Yeah. After I showed him that, hey, it takes an hour and a half to build the clean build on Mambo. Um, and we came up with something like that with a bunch of modules, like uh, onboarding to handle like stuff like a creating account session to handle authorization stuff, market. So, so we are basically the training app, yeah? Uh, maybe you remember from the last year. Um, so we are trading on markets, yeah? So for example, you can say that Bitcoin is going up or Bitcoin is going down. 
So our markets module is basically responsible for the things like searching for markets, for favoriting the markets, and stuff like that. Payments, because you somehow need to top up your account in order to trade, and dealing. Yeah, so dealing is basically the core functionality of the app. This is the main reason why people use it. And all the other features are basically meant to make, that make you go to this dealing module and deal. And um, on the top of it, we have the app module. And on the bottom of it, we have a base module. And the app module is just a tiny stuff gluing stuff together. And base module only contains the utilities, no business, uh, no business stuff, only utilities that are shared across different feature modules, all right? So few decisions that we have made uh, at the beginning of the project, and we follow till today, is that the feature modules don't depend on each other. We had, in the, in the past, we had lots of issues with, like, you go to the dealing code, you want to refactor it, and after two days of constant refactoring, you realize that you are already refactoring payments because everything was so coupled together. So what we wanted to achieve is to have some kind of a compile time validation that we are not introduced coupling between the modules. Also, the UI and the business logic are split within the modules. Yeah, so we still follow, we still we follow the model, uh, we follow the model view presenter uh, within the module. When you have like a different, uh, when you have a different screen, the model layer uh, is well separated using the packages uh, from uh, from the UI layer. And app depends on all the feature modules, and all the feature modules depend on base, which kind of drives the fact that base had to be like a business agnostic. It, it shouldn't know about anything business related. All right, so let's see some hope. Let's see some code, how it looks like, yeah? Uh, let's talk about the navigation. So, because modules somehow need to navigate between each other. Uh, so, imagine the following. User, see, um, user sees a market list, and market list belongs to the markets module. And then tapping on the market item moves you to the dealing screen, okay? Which is already in the dealing module. Since markets module is on the same layer as the dealing module, it cannot reference the classes from the dealing module, yeah? Because the code wouldn't compile. So how do we solve it? That's a YouTube video that I, that I planned to show. We can try if it works. Yeah, so, so that's our app. Um, actually, you don't really see anything. Uh, so this is a list of markets, right? You tap on the market, and you see a dealing screen. Yeah, you can tap also on those dealing buttons, and you see a deal ticket. So basically, you pick up the size, and basically the size of your trade, and so on. So how does it work? Um, within the markets module, we declare the markets navigator interface, which contains, this interface basically contains all the actions that the markets module can trigger in terms of the navigation to the outer modules, okay? So the markets module, and the list of markets specifically, knows that if I'm tapped, I want to go to this deal ticket, I want to go to the dealing screen, user wants to deal. But markets module has no knowledge whatsoever what kind of a, how to do it, yeah? It, because, well, it doesn't depend on dealing. It has no knowledge about that. So then this interface, among the other interfaces as well that are exposed by different modules, is implemented within the app module, so this topmost layer. Uh, because since the app module depends on everything, it can map it to, in our case, this dealing tabs activity. And then with Dagger, we are binding one to the other, yeah? So you are just injecting your navigator interface within the markets module, within the, uh, within the fragment, within the activity, within the presenter, within the controller, whatever you use, and you invoke the method. Markets module has no knowledge whatsoever what's inside, but in as the effect, it starts the new activity, which is using already the new model. Each module defines the interface, uh, and app kind of does the mapping. Yeah? Application is the only place which knows what does it mean to navigate to the certain screen. Uh, also, the decorators. Uh, sometimes you display things from different modules on a single activity. Yeah? So that's another decision we have made. So this is the example. Uh, 
I will try to be as descriptive as I can because the resolution isn't that great. Um, so the list itself comes from markets, yeah? Um, but for example, this yellow bar you can see, you probably don't see a text. It's telling you, sign up with your marketing preferences, GDPR stuff. Um, and this yellow bar, this little yellow bar, actually comes from onboarding already. Yeah, so we had to come with a solution that would let us define the screen with the list of markets that will contain this yellow GDPR bar at the top of the screen without markets knowing about the onboarding. Yeah? Uh, so how do we do it? So this is one of the flavors. This is one of the flavors of our app. The other flavor still contains the navigation drawer instead of the bottom bar. It's like the transition is in process, let's say. So we are defining something which is called the decorator command. In this case, the navigation drawer decorator command, which is implementing the interface. And this interface is defined within this base module. So all the application has an access to this interface and can implement it. Uh, and then. Uh, there is this app activity decorator, which is defined within the app module, implementing another interface from the base module, activity decorator, which basically gets the instance of the activity and invokes all those decorator commands on this activity instance. So actual decorator commands implementation can be defined within the module. So for example, we have this uh, search icon in the toolbar at the top. It comes from the markets module. Um, and uh, it's basically done by another decorator command, uh, which is simply attaching a fragment which doesn't have a view. It just has on create options menu yeah, as the icon over there. Yeah? So those screen has, these particular screen have no knowledge whatsoever about how to attach this icon over there. It all happens with those decorators. App decides which decorator commands to use and where. Uh, some decorators make use from the contract. So uh, we have a base layout within the project. Uh, which has a content inside, but it also has like a bottom container, top container, and so on. So if there is a decorator that says, I want to attach something to the bottom of the screen, it just uses the uh, resource ID that's defined within the base module. And guess what? We are pretty happy about this. Build time's super nice. Incremental build 15 seconds. Um, pretty nice separation. You are working on one feature. And uh, only single module is changed in most of the cases. So stuff was working pretty good. And then app bundles. <laughs> All right? So this is the structure that um, app bundles is, uh, uh, is imposing. We're going to talk about it. Uh, we're going to talk about it in detail in a second. So first impression, <laughs> wow, we just won a gold medal. We did the modular architecture at the beginning of the year. And now Google is going to encourage all the developers to do the modular architecture and will be able to benefit from it with a smaller APK size. Second impression, <laughs> oh wow, we have some problem. So small recap of what unbundles are. Have you attended the Voitex talk yesterday? Where's your hand? Everybody did. Wojtek promised me he's going to mention this presentation at the end and then forgot. He was so stressed with this big audience. Uh, but never mind. Uh, so the small recap. <laughs> well, dynamic feature modules mean that you can set up your particular features uh, to be installable on demand. Okay, So you can reduce the APK size. Uh, Android, Google Play, they don't provide any kind of the UI overlay, uh, which is displayed to the user at the time of uh, at the time of the installation of a certain module. You do it on your own, which is actually pretty nice because imagine you have like a list of something and that list of something is actually covered from the dynamic feature module. During the time of the installation of this module, you can simply display the same progress bar as would normally appear during loading the list from the internet. Yeah? Of course, it will take slightly longer, but you are deciding for the UI uh, of your app. Uh, Google Play app signing needs to be enabled in order to make it work. I hope you are using it at the moment. It's more safe. They should, you should have no security concerns over it. Uh, and actually, if you want to benefit from app bundles, not only from the dynamic feature modules, you need to, uh, you need to use app signing. And uh, unfortunately, uh, up until now, you cannot use test dynamic installation locally. Uh, what you need to have is you need to have a developer account 
And what I recommend is creating the, some random instance of a test account as a draft, and you can push the uh, app bundle file into the internal, uh, internal test channel. So you don't actually have to fill all those details regarding the page description, the app description, and so on. You can just create the app and upload the, uh, upload the file in there. So it's pretty fast. And it's still in beta. So if you would like to use it on production, um, you, need to, um, you, need to, you need to ask Google for it uh, to, to, have it uh, to have it enabled. We didn't. Uh, I don't have, so I don't have a production experience with that yet. All I'm going to share right now is basically my thoughts and my feeling about this and how I think we're going to implement this and how we did kind of a draft implementation. So in case you see anything super ugly or super bad and you know how to make things better, go tell me before I start implementing it, all right? And ship it to Prod. Uh, regarding the size, um, Maybe I just didn't found it, but there is like a no limit specified, no certain limit specified on what kind of a su maximum size your dynamic feature module might have. Uh, however, in case it's too big, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure how what, what too big means, if it's a kind of a static size or it depends whether the user is on like a server network on the Wi-Fi, but there might be user uh, confirmation required in order to install the module. Then the Google Play Call library is going to return you a pending intent, which you need to start in order to, uh, in order to make the user confirm this. So, um, so this is the structure, yeah? We have the base APK, and we have this dynamic feature one, dynamic feature two, and dynamic feature three built on the top of the base APK. So if you go and read on some blog posts, there is already a pretty nice coverage about the dynamic feature modules on the internet. And some of the, some of the blog posts are actually pretty good. Uh, but some of them will tell you that the dynamic feature modules are like the Android library modules. But the thing is that there is a fundamental difference. Dynamic feature modules depend on your base app, not vice versa. So in other words, in other words app, won't be able to access the classes of the dynamic feature module. All right, so dynamic feature module instead will be able to access uh, the classes of this base slash app module. It might be pretty confusing given I, uh, the structure I showed you at the beginning of, of the presentation, but the base module is basically the core of your app. It's in case you start using the dynamic feature modules, the app slash base module is something that basically your users install from the Google Play by default. So it makes a lot of sense, yeah? It's a different structure than we impose in our own infrastructure. I mean, it's completely different, like a literally 180 degrees. Uh, but it makes a lot of sense, yeah? Because you have some base content of the app, and then users on demand might install content on the top, yeah? It would not be possible to achieve what the app bundles are meant to achieve with the dynamic feature modules with the structure we have done in our code base. Yeah, you need to download the modules that are being added to the top. So the app will not have an access to them, but they will have an access to the app. Um, and well, then we were crying for a couple of days that um, everything we have done is wrong. Um, but then we realized that, hmm, do we actually care that much? I mean, is it really a problem, yeah? Um, what was the purpose of our modular approach in the, in the first place? Yeah? We wanted to have a good separation between different business areas, let's say, a lack of coupling between features, fast build times. Purpose of dynamic feature modules is to get the smaller APK size. And the good separation comes as a side effect, but the main idea is that we can reduce the APK size by removing the features with the dynamic feature modules, not the app bundle as a whole, remove the features that user is likely to not need. Okay? So that's the proposal. So this is the structure that we are having at the moment. And you can basically put your own structure of your own code base here uh, and then dynamic feature modules 
I basically added to the top. Yeah? All those blocks, the gray ones and the green ones, and dealing, which is orange for some reason, um, all of them are your base app module. Yeah? And no matter how they are structured, you can still build those dynamic features on the top. Even if you have like a monolithic app with just a single module, you can start doing so by extracting one feature after another. So it doesn't mean you have to have rewrite everything from scratch. So there are some common issues with, uh, with the whole thing of having those dynamic feature modules being on the top of the app. One of, this, one of these issues is like referencing activities, yeah? How do I start the activity from the app and when this activity is defined within the dynamic feature module? And the other problem is referencing everything else apart from the activities. Yeah, all the classes or whatever I want to have uh, within the app. I'm going to also to tell you a bit how, uh, how I managed to solve the dependency injection uh, within the feature module. So, storing activity is not much to talk about. Intensive class name, done. Activity is starting. Yeah? Actually, you need to remember that from the activity that, you are, that is starting the activity belonging to the dynamic feature module, uh, you need to override the attach base context and invoke one of the methods from the Google Play uh, core library that you will find within the uh, you will find within the documentation. Uh, there is some magic required that this library does. You just do one line and you forget about that. Um, you can also do fragments. So there is this method that nobody probably remembers and nobody probably is using for a reason. I'm not using it as well. Uh, there is a fragment instantiate which kind of gets a string with a fragment class. You cast it to the dialog fragment and you show it on the, on the supper fragment manager. And bam, automatically right after installing the dynamic feature module, which did a crazy magic to your class loader, um, you can start a dialog that wasn't there at all previously. For everything else, everything else is easy as well. You just do class for name, and you have a class over here, yeah? Um, yeah, not cool. Um, and uh, will require lots of, lots of stuff in order to handle. So you can try to reduce this pain. Um, and um, so how I was trying to refactor this was like creating an interface within the app module and create a delegating implementation of that interface within the app module. Yeah, so something like that. There is a module service, it has one method, then there is the implementation of this interface, uh, which has the field with that interface reference as well to the real implementation. And you have like a show dialog message, which is basically delegating it back, yeah? So now the idea is that after you manage to install the dynamic feature module, you are simply instantiating this, you are instantiating this field. This doesn't need to be delegating implementation. It might be some factory that you are then referencing from your Dagger module. Yeah, if you uh, if you need to. Um, still, however, you need to have this class for name somehow, because you need to tell the dynamic feature module, "Hey, man, initialize yourself." Yeah, and then since uh, since this feature module has the access to the M module, it might have the access to this delegating object or whatever, and might have it might set its own instance, uh, its own instance to the wrapper. I know that probably being on the stage is not really a valid way of providing um, feedbacks to the author of various libraries, but yesterday after the after party, uh, when I was still working on my slides after a couple of beers, I thought, hey, it would be all so much easier if a developer would be able to define some kind of a callback or some kind of like a application class, like a part of application class within the feature modules manifest file that would get invoked, either this is installed or would get invoked at the startup of the application if it's already installed. Yeah, because then you could implement this in a way that uh, you are basically setting 
the proper instances to the proper classes. And in case the application module needs to, uh, needs to use something from, uh, from that module, uh, that would be super easy without any kind of the reflection uh, made by the end developer. Yeah? Maybe there is something like that and I just missed it in the documentation. Um, we'll figure during the Q&A session. Um, yeah. The easy way that will probably fit most of your needs is that the module's entry point is area activity or a fragment. And then since that activity is already defined within this feature module, you are able to simply, uh, you are able to simply use all the classes from that module and from the base module as well. Um, so I don't know, imagine you just have a base app activity there is, the, there is a button somewhere on the screen. You tap it. You know that tapping on this button means turning some feature that is dynamic. So you then download the feature and then you start the activity. And then you are covered. Yeah? I know it will not work in all the use cases you might have. Like imagine you are doing some image processing library. Yeah? And there is one filter that nobody, really, nobody is really using apart from like a five people one of them being your top customer, and um, and but you don't but you don't want those people to have this kind of a filter for the image, like being don't being downloaded for all the users because most likely they will not they will not need them. But apparently this dynamic feature module depends on some native library that is like a 10 max, yeah. So you don't have a separate fragment, you don't have a separate activity, you just want to use some library that was downloaded, yeah. So then you need to then you need to work with this class for name, uh, which is a little bit tricky, uh, but I guess the use cases for it are pretty limited. So even if you start using it, you will not have like a multiple places containing this call or on the code base. So on the dependency injection, um, You are probably familiar. Are you familiar with Dagger? Is everyone familiar with Dagger, most of people? Good. If you are familiar with Dagger, then you are familiar with the thermo siphon. Uh, if you read the documentation. <laughs> um, so let's say we have the application component with the application scope that's keeping our application-wide singletons. And uh, it's defined within the base module. It keeps the stuff like, uh, like information about our session. Uh, and it kind of has this term of siphon, which we, for some reason, want to be a singleton that will be living as long as our application process lives. All right? Yeah, all right. So, and now, within the dynamic feature, you want to declare another component. So, we, w there are like a two ways of binding components together. One which we prefer to use in our, all, in our approach with the modules using the subcomponents. So we are basically building a component around the, uh, around the, outer, uh, around the outer component, in this case, application component. But that wouldn't be possible because that would imply that this application component here would need to know the reference to the, uh, to the, to the child component to the subcomponent, yeah? And as we spoke, that's not possible because you don't have an access to this class in the compile time. Uh, but the, there is another way of binding the components together, which is the uh, component dependencies. It's slightly different. It makes, you, uh, it, it makes you do this, so you need to expose the dependency within your application component here. So it's slightly more problematic, uh, but it will work for the dynamic feature modules. So, establishing secure connection. FAD is offline. Oops. Sorry again.
you have 3G here? No, I already have it. Yeah, sorry for that again. So now you just declare this application component as a dependency. Uh, and you build it like that within the, within the dynamic feature module. Yeah, you use this dagger generated class, uh, dagger dynamic feature component. You invoke the builder, which is also generated. And then you take the application component, uh, invoke the application component method, and uh, pass the reference that you usually keep somewhere. If you are using dagger and you are having this application component, I believe everybody has. So you, j you just probably keep it in the somewhere in the application class or, uh, or as a static field somewhere. Then you build it, you inject it, and that's how you are able to use all kind of uh, outer dependencies from the base module and inject them directly to your dynamic feature module. Um, all right, so that would be it for the code details. Uh, so let's talk about kind of a, let's, let's discuss some kind of a theory. So what do you think is like a good candidate for a dynamic feature module, yeah? So my opinion on this is that this is something that only portion of your user need and something that users will not likely need in a short time after the installation. I mean, it's not and, it's like or, yeah? It doesn't make sense to extract something to be a dynamic feature module if majority of your users will need to install it right after. Um, because that would be annoying. Eh? Imagine you are at home, you want to check out some app when you are going to work, you are starting downloading it, and then when you are on your subway, you discover that it's only like a 10% of the app downloaded. <laughs> That's kind of a disappointing. Uh, so don't do this for the features that are basically core features of your app or are like a first activity that will turn on uh, anyways. Um, so for our case, that could be like a document upload because only like users that just registered uh, and only the users that failed the automatic verification will need to uh, will need to go through this process. Maybe payments because people tend to some people tend to like uh, do payments more on the desktop than on mobile. I don't know why, uh, but we have it in the stats. Uh, so you need to, we need to figure that out for yourself based on the data. Like, are there some features that are probably not going to be used by your users after they are installed? So my piece of advice is start using app bundles because it costs nothing to use app bundles. Uh, you will benefit from them anyways uh, just by separating out the resource, di resource uh, drawable resources, or the languages, or the native libraries. You all just shrink your APK size without any effort. Dynamic feature modules, though, you might need them, and you might not. I mean, you might feel that they are not really needed, and this is for you, for your use case, because, for example, your app is small, contains only like a couple of the activities that are being used like equally. Uh, and this is fine. Don't try to do it like uh, just for the sake of doing it. You can have a nice modular architecture without using dynamic feature modules as well. Uh, and they are not that scary because whatever architecture you are using at the moment, you can use the dynamic feature modules on the top of it. Yeah? So we can start extracting single features to the dynamic feature modules without refactoring the whole rest of the app. And don't treat it like it's the ultimate way, way of modularizing your app. As I said earlier, um, this is the kind of a structure of those, of, of how you are structuring your dynamic feature modules on the top of the app. is kind of imposed by the fact that those modules are downloaded on the top of the app and now loaded within the runtime. And they need to be, they need to be available at some point of runtime. It doesn't, it, it might not be the best way to handle the best architecture for your use case. Uh, so in case, for example, you only need like a two, three dynamic feature modules, and you have like dozens of other features within the app, you can think of those dynamic feature modules as being kind of separated uh, and built on the top while following your own architecture for the whole rest of the app. All right, and, and this is probably what we're gonna do. Um, that's about it. Do we have time for questions?